We looked through over 470,000 transactions in the condo market since 1995 and calculated annualized investment returns across all of them in the largest study of its kind as featured on Bloomberg. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Data Stories. My name is Michael Cho from Urban Zoom. So today we're gonna to look at investment returns of condo properties in Singapore. And we're gonna do it at a scale that's never been quite done before. In fact, we're gonna look at every single transaction since 1995. And we're gonna calculate the annualized investment returns of every one of them and aggregate all these returns together. And this is really a huge undertaking. And to my knowledge, the biggest study of its kind. We are very proud and grateful to be featured on Bloomberg a while back. I'm just gonna put the link in in the description below so you can check it out for yourself. Now, since we are building this study from the bottom up, it actually gives us very granular detail, which allows us to slice and dice the data along many different dimensions. For instance, we can look at things between freehold versus leasehold. We can look at projects kind of ranked by completion cohort year. Uh, we can look at resale versus new launch. We can look at returns based on districts and etc. etc. So there's really a gold mine of insights to go through from this study. Definitely, we can't do it in one single video. Anyway, if you're like me, you like data, you like the stories coming from these numbers, definitely consider subscribing and so you won't miss out. All right, let's start with the basic. What exactly is an annualized investment return? Now, some of you may be finance or investment guys. For those of you, feel free to jump ahead one, two minutes. For those of you who are not too sure what it exactly is it, I'll try to explain to you so you have a good grasp of what it means. And let me start with an example. So say there's this guy, his name is Mr. Double. He bought a home at $1 million on 1st Jan 2010. Now say he eventually sold that same property five years later at $2 million on 1st Jan 2015. So that's great, you know, as his name suggests, he doubled his money in five years. Now consider another dude, his name this time is Mr. Triple. Okay, Mr. Triple bought another home at $1 million on the same day that Mr. Double also bought his home. So both of them bought on 1st Jan 2010. And then Mr. Triple then sold his home at $3 million. So he basically tripled his money, but over a period of 10 years. Question is, which of them actually did a better job in their investment? Now clearly Mr. Triple tripled his money, but he did it over a longer period of time, right? He did it over 10 years. Whereas Mr. Double doubled his money in five years. So how do you compare when you have a difference in uh, investment holding period? So this is where analyze investment returns come in. Uh, it's really just a way to normalize the time effect of a different holding period of different investments. So that way you can still compare them. And here's the formula. This is not a finance class, so I'm not gonna go into the detail, but if you actually run through the math, you realize that as some of you might have expected, actually Mr. Double, uh, even though he only doubled his money, he actually come out on top in terms of annualized basis. He actually got 14.9% per annum, whereas Mr. Triple, even though he tripled his money, he only got a 11.6% per annum, so lower than Mr. Double on an annualized basis. Now, some of you may ask, how about the rental income that both Mr. Double and Mr. Triple would have received while they're holding on to the property? Great question, uh, keep it in your head. We will address it in a later episode. But for now, just to keep things simple, let's just look at annualized return from a purely capital gain slash loss perspective, okay? So now that we've got the basic math out of the way, let's look at the actual data we use in this study. So like I mentioned earlier, we actually look at every single condo transaction since 1995. So something like 470,000 of them. And from there, we then look for what we call a buy-sell pair. So here's an example. Take a look at this particular unit, seven Leiden Heights on the third floor at the Leiden. And Dilidon is basically one of the biggest condo projects in Singapore. There was a transaction record on the 12th of June 2012 at 1.4 million roughly, followed by another transaction record on 30th of October 2019 at $1.59 million. So the homeowner basically bought this unit in 2012 and sold it subsequently in 2019. So that's what we meant by a buy-sell pair. So for a single property, at least a sequence of two transactions, a buy and a sell. And from there, then we can apply that formula to calculate the annualized return. Now that is just one observation of buy sell pair now imagine doing this across all 470,000 transaction records and basically we found 160,000 buy sell pairs so how do we go from 470,000 to 160,000 the way to think about this is there will be properties where there's only one transaction record for that particular home meaning uh, the guy who bought the home have not sold yet or there will be also on the other extreme where one single property is actually changed hands multiple times in fact I'll give you an example so this particular unit at the Clearwater a project at Baduk. This actually really takes a kick. It actually changed hands over seven times in the last 25 year period. So there's definitely a range. And in fact, we went from 470,000 transaction records to 160,000 buy-sell pair 
And if you actually look at the, these buy sell pairs, these actually only represented just over 100,000 condo units. So as you can see, hundreds of thousands of transaction records that we have to clean up and all that. But now that we've done the hard work, we can finally slice and dust the data however we want. So let's just start with this chart. Um, this chart shows the distribution of analyzed returns across all of these 160,000 buy sell pairs across the 25 year period. If you look at the X axis, that's the range of analyzed returns, while the Y axis shows you the histogram of how how many homeowners actually managed to achieve that particular return and from here looks like the most common analyzed return or in statistics terms the mode is 1.5 percent per annum but it's not a super obvious peak it's actually pretty spread out you have people making very healthy returns, say more than 20% per annum. Uh, but then again, you also have people making pretty bad losses, right? In fact, negative return. So here I've color coded them. The red portion is really just the folks who made negative returns. So these guys lost money, while the blue portion are the people making some profit from the capital gain. Now, in fact, in terms of actual percentage, something like 83% of sellers at least break even, whereas about 17% of them decided to bite the bullet and sold at a loss. And again, this is across 160,000 buy sell pairs. So if you add up every single individual bar here, you will still add back to 160,000. Now, obviously, if you want to treat something as an investment that has inherent risk, you definitely want a healthy return that justify that risk. So comparing returns to 0% is probably not good enough, right? You definitely want a higher return. So the question is, what is a real benchmark that we should use? instead of just 0%. It turns out in the investment world, there's something called a risk-free rate. And to me, the closest thing to a risk-free rate in Singapore is actually what CPF pays Singaporean in the CPF ordinary account. And in fact, since 1999, this CPF interest rate has been capped at 2.5% per annum. Now, this is not fixed by law, so in theory, they can change it again, but you can see that CPF has a lot of determination to at least keep things at that level since they've kept it since 1999. And to me, this is probably as close to a definition of risk-free rate uh, that is at least available to people like you and me, regular Singaporean. And so if we use this as the benchmark, 2.5% per annum instead of the 0% we looked at earlier, you will see that only 63% of these 160,000 homeowners actually managed to beat this CPF uh, ordinary interest rate rate. Now, I just want to point out here that in our calculation, we didn't factor into any frictional cost, meaning we didn't take into account legal fees, uh, agent commissions, or the taxes or stamp duties, etc. that you may pay. So in a way, this is kind of the best case scenario already. Obviously, we haven't counted rentals yet, which we'll do in a later episode. But if you just look at things from a capital gain perspective, the numbers are pretty sobering. Now, to be fair, there's also a pretty sizable group of people who make very healthy returns. Uh, I think anything more than 10% is already pretty phenomenal. And mind you, these are all unleveraged return and as you know the mortgage rate over the last 10 years have been really low so for some of these people who made an leverage return of 10 percent certainly their leverage return will even be higher than that on a per annum basis so it's not all doom and gloom you definitely have people who are smart investors or are guided by very good advice from the agent or just sheer luck and, and they're making a killing in the market um, but on the whole if you look at things really in aggregate i think it's still pretty sobering that such a large proportion something like more than 30 percent of these 160,000 home sellers are across the 25 years, in my view, didn't make a return that justified the risk. So anyway, what we've seen so far today is an aggregate of investment returns from condo property investment in Singapore across a 25 year period. And in the next episode, what we're gonna do is dive deeper to look at how investment returns have actually changed over time. And we're also gonna look at what is a typical holding period for some of these condo property owners. Anyway, if you like this kind of content where we go very deep into the data, uh, but we try to explain things as simple as possible, so hopefully you understand definitely consider subscribing to this channel it give us a lot of encouragement if you do so subscribe like share with your friend all that jazz so that's a wrap stay safe and i'll see you in the next one